Welcome in everyone to Seismic PE Prep example number 18. And we have a little twist today. As you can see, we have not one, not two, but three parts to our example 18. They're not really parts. They're all independent questions that you could be asked on the exam. However, I think each of them are kind of bite size example problems. So I wanted to clump them together to give you enough content to, to help you in your studies in a single video. Uh, I am going with the special design provisions for Wind and Seismic, the 2021 edition. So that is the newest edition. Not positive if this code cycle is in the seismic exam yet, but make sure you're checking that. Um, the information contained with these three problems should be unchanged. Um, the criteria in the 2015 SpidWiz, yes, is the previous code cycle, um, or I should say the current code cycle. I, I forget if it's transitioned over yet. Um, so you shouldn't be affected with your final solution for these, but always make sure I try to stress that when you're studying for your, your exams, before you jump into practice problems and, and studying through uh, the material codes, make sure you're using the correct cycle of that code. Uh, for developing the design capacity of a nail, what should be the minimum distance from the edge of a wood structural panel to the center of the nail? Now, when I first saw this question, I kind of was like, all right, what well, we're talking about, uh, lateral systems made out of wood. So you have wood shear walls and you also have wood diaphragms. Which one particularly are they talking about? It could apply to both. So if I had some extra time, I would say, uh, let me check both the diaphragm condition and the shear wall condition and make sure that I'm covering both my bases before moving on. Otherwise, I think they left out that little bit of info and they should tell you, are you talking about shear walls or diaphragms? However, at the end of this first problem, I think we'll come to a conclusion as to why maybe they didn't need to specify that. Since we're doing the shear wall first, you're gonna find yourself in section 4.3.6. This is the construction requirements of shear walls. It's a great section that I didn't really get fully comfortable with or, or know inside and out until I started studying for my SE. It's one thing to go to just the um, the tables for your shear wall designs and your diaphragm designs. It's another thing to head to these sections to make sure that you are doing all the little nitty gritty things from a constructability standpoint to make sure that you can achieve the design values that are listed in those tables. If you don't construct it right, you don't get to just use those capacities. You know, they tested those systems under uh, specific criteria and that criteria is listed here. We'll scroll down a bit and actually find ourselves in 4.3.7 sheathed wood frame shear wall systems and you will see at the beginning here they give you a kind of a little like uh, table of contents towards this section. So you have wood structural panel shear walls in section 4371 and 4372 okay then you have particle bore shear walls, structural fiber shear walls, gypsum board shear walls, blaster, single uh, diagonal, double diagonal. I'm not gonna say all of them, I almost did, but I didn't. We don't know if it was a diaphragm or shear wall. So we're gonna find ourselves just checking this criteria, which contains two sections. So let's head to 4371. We scroll down just a bit and we find ourselves right here for wood structural panel shear walls. And it says the shear walls shall be constructed as follows. And it gives you criteria on the panels. Um, it gives you criteria on blocking requirements. It goes into some exceptions here that we don't really care about here today. Then it goes on to, ah, nails shall be located at least three eighths from the panel edges. Beautiful, that's the criteria we're looking for. It goes on to maximum nail spacing for panel edges. It goes on to intermediate framing, blah, 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 blah. So you should be reading through all of those to see what the requirements are. However, we have what we're looking for, three eighths. Well, that was for this section, but it also says you need to check out the next section. So let's see what's going on over there. That dumps us right here, where we have shear walls using wood structural panels over gypsum wall board or gypsum sheathing board. So a different condition. And you will see as you read through this section in general, that at the beginning of a change in section, they basically, it's almost like a header that says, hey, for this shear wall type, boom, do this stuff. Basically, the size and spacing of nails at shear wall boundaries, panel edges shall be as provided in table 3B. That's your design tables for capacities. The shear wall shall be constructed in accordance with 4371. That was the previous section. So it says, hey, it gives you some additional criteria here for this condition, but then it ultimately says everything else still needs to be designed like we just specified in the previous section. 
So I would say that that 3 8 inch criteria still applies to us. And that's everything that we have for these type of shear balls that were part of this question here today. So 3 8 inch. Now let's head over to the diaphragm section and see what we got going on. We find ourselves in section 4.2.7, construction requirements. This is for diaphragm. So 4.2 is diaphragms and 4.3, I believe, is shear walls. Um, but check the you know table of contents, stuff like that. But that's I'm almost positive that's how they, they lay it out. Um, so they have the same type of section, construction requirements. And then we scroll down, and then it starts to split it up into diaphragm types. So we head to 428 for sheathed wood frame diaphragm assemblies. It gives some general criteria. And then if we scroll to 42811, you can see the first type, blocked diaphragms. All right. And then before we jump into that, I'll just show you 42812, high load block diaphragms. 42813, unblocked diaphragms. Okay. Well, if it was blocked, the same type of criteria says the diaphragm shall be constructed as follows. And then it goes on to talk about your panels, to talk about your nails, it talks about spacing, but it also gives you right here, nails shall be located at least three eighths from the edges of the panels. We're studying here today. We might be going way too far into the weeds on this first question. However, I want to get you comfortable with the material code. High load block diaphragms, same thing. Diaphragm shall be constructed as follows. And you can see in number two, three eighths inch, but not less than distances shown in figure 4C. Interesting. So we'll check that out in one moment here. Let's check out unblocked diaphragms. And then we can see where diaphragms are designed as unblocked. The diaphragm shall be constructed as specified in 42811, except basically no blocking. And then they go on to say um, what that entails. But they're saying, hey, you still got to do all the requirements for 42811 very similar to the same literature that was given in the shear wall section for blocked shear walls versus unblocked shear walls. We know that this 3 8 still holds up here as well, so that's good. So the last thing we really just need to check out is this 4C figure. And that lands us here. High load diaphragms are, as the title suggests, diaphragms that can handle significantly more load. And in order to do that, they beef up the framing for one, they beef up the number of nails too, and in order to get more nails, they actually do uh, multiple rows of staggered nailing along each panel edge. And that is what this figure highlights, showing different panel edge conditions with multiple rows of fasteners. We have the 3 8 minimum there. We have 3 8 minimum over here. Something that I found interesting though, is that they have one half inch minimum here, which is kind of strange because this is for a supporting member that's uh, nominally four inches wide. So why you need a further minimum edge distance for a member that is wider is kind of strange to me, but here we are. So it's three eighths all across the board, everywhere we've searched high and low for shear walls and diaphragms. However, for some reason, there's one instance where you have one half inch minimum, but I'm gonna rule out today, they didn't talk at all about high load diaphragms in the question. So I think we've just gone way too far in the analysis here. So I'm gonna go ahead and say 3 8 minimum is your answer for question number one. All right, question number two. For a wood structural panel diaphragm with supports spaced at 48 inches on center, what should be the fastener spacing along intermediate framing members? Let's underline the important stuff. Wood structural panel, because that is a type of uh, diaphragm. And then they also, in this uh, question, actually say diaphragm. We have our support framing, 40 inches on center. This is your purlins, this is your joists, you know, your floor framing, yada, 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 whatever you want to classify that as. Let's see if there's any implications from that uh, framing spacing that impacts our diaphragm at all. They're asking for intermediate fastener spacing or uh, commonly is referred to as field nailing. So this is not the edge nailing requirements around the edge of the panel or boundary nailing requirements, which is at the boundary of your entire diaphragm. And we all know that the edge nailing is the critical connection to develop the capacity of your diaphragm. So the intermediate nailing and spacing is less critical. So oftentimes it's more laxed and has a, uh, a wider spacing for the fasteners. Believe it or not, we're gonna find ourselves right back at that constructability section for diaphragms. 
Um, and in this case, the sheathed wood diaphragm section, 4.2.8. And we'll start off by checking the block diaphragm, the unblocked diaphragm, and the high load diaphragm, okay? Just to make sure, again, we're covering our bases. Maximum nail spacing shall be six inches on center when support spacing of 48 inches on center is specified and 12 inches on center for closer support spacing. Well, since we're at 48 inches, you guessed it, for a block diaphragm, we are six inches on center for the field nailing. For high load diaphragms, you can see that the maximum nail spacing shall be six inches on center when support spacing is greater than 32 inches on center, or the maximum spacing shall be 12 inches on center when the support spacing is 32 inches on center or less. So it goes from that 48 criteria to the 32 criteria, meaning it's more strict and that's because you are dealing with higher load, so it's a more it's a more critical system. So you don't get as much uh, lax criteria in terms of your support spacing. They didn't talk about high load today, so we'll just we'll skip by this one. And then for unblocked diaphragms, we still fall into the same criteria as saying, hey, it needs to be per the requirements of the blocked diaphragm criteria to begin with. So same thing there. Um, so six inches on center for 48 uh, inch on center spacing of our framing and greater or 12 inches on center for less than 48 inch on center framing spacing. With all of that compiled, I would say since we are at 48 inches on center, that we are a six inch on center intermediate uh, nailing to our framing system. And for our last question of the day, what is the maximum diaphragm dimension ratio for double diagonal sheathing? Hmm. This one also kind of struck a chord with me. I thought the question uh, was worded strangely. It's asking for the maximum diaphragm dimension ratio. So we're talking about diaphragms. The type of diaphragm is a double diagonal sheathed system. But what is the dimension ratio? I'm not really familiar with that. What they are getting at is what is the aspect ratio or the maximum aspect ratio you are permitted for a diaphragm constructed of double diagonal sheathing. The aspect ratio table, we're going to jump back over and we'll actually find ourselves in table 4.2.2. See there. The table is located at the very beginning of the diaphragm section. And this is really everything that you're going to need to solve this problem. So you are permitted to create wood diaphragms of only a certain aspect ratio or a certain geometry size. Um, and what they mean really by that is that ultimately wood diaphragms, more often than not, you wanna keep nice and square when you can. When it becomes really, really long in one direction and really short in comparison, that's no longer a good thing for wood diaphragms. Um, and so the code caps you um, with that permitted aspect ratio. It's all dependent upon the type of wood diaphragm that you're constructing or designing. And so they say, hey, sheathed wood diaphragm assemblies, which one are you? And then they give a permitted maximum length to width ratio or AKA aspect ratio that you use as the designer and need to stay within. For us here today, we're at the bottom, double layer diagonally sheathed lumber you get a four to one maximum aspect ratio. So it can be four units long and one unit tall maximum. Um, and that is not your entire diaphragm. So if you have a big warehouse that's, you know, 600 feet long and only 50 feet long, you say, well, my building's just that, that long. I have to use something else. No, this is an aspect ratio of your diaphragm between vertical lateral elements. So if you have braced frames or let's, let's call it shear walls, it's likely shear walls, um, cutting up that warehouse, now your aspect ratio is just each chunk between vertical lateral elements, okay? But simply put, four to one for the criteria given, that's it for today's problem. And just like that, without actually drawing any criteria on the actual problem, we knocked out Example 18.1, 18.2, and 18.3. But let me know in the comments below if I missed anything, if something was unclear, um, if you know I could do better in areas. I want to improve always for all of you out there. Thanks for liking, thanks for subscribing, and thanks for interacting in any way that you have on the channel. It's been awesome. Until next time, this is Rich with Team Kestva. Peace.